Welcome, my name is Matthew, and in this video I'm going to talk to you about angles and radian measures, which is one of the very first conversations we need to have in our study of pre-calculus. And I'm going to be using notes that were originally adapted for Blitzer's pre-calculus third edition, which is not the current version anymore. Uh, but these notes are still very relevant, and if you're one of my students, then I highly recommend you download these notes so that you can be filling them in as you go along. And if you're not one of my students, I'm sorry that you don't have access to these notes. I wonder if there's a way I can get you access. I'll look into that. But until then, let's talk about angle measures and radians. All right, so the first thing we see here are angles in standard position. And what you'll notice, here we go, what you'll notice on the right-hand side of this graph is that the angle is going to be I, sort of identified or defined by these two sort of rays. So this, this arrow that's pointing off to the right in blue is going to be the initial side, and that's always going to be along the positive x-axis. And then there's this rotation that's happening that comes up, so we're taking that initial side, rotating it around, in this case, into the second quadrant, and that's going to be our terminal side. We could rotate that and end up in the first quadrant, second, third, fourth. Uh, we're going to get to a point in these notes where we're going to rotate the terminal side, and it's going to go around and around and around multiple times. And we're going to even have to unwind that and try to find some positive co-terminal angles. But we'll get to that. But realize that you have an initial side and a terminal side, and that's what helps to define the angle that we're working with. Here, this angle is being... Uh, denoted by alpha, and oh, there's I have a tail in my face. Sophie is already gracing us with her presence. How's it going, Soph? Okay. It could be alpha uh, to the right. You'll notice that this one is denoted by theta. Um, those are essentially arbitrary. Now, in the first example where the angle is alpha, that alpha measure, that angle measure, is a positive angle measure. And I know that because the terminal side has been rotated counterclockwise or up and away from that positive x-axis. In the second example to the right where the angle is measured or denoted by theta, capital Greek letter theta, that angle measure must be negative because the terminal side has rotated down or clockwise away from the initial side of the angle. All right, so let's get into some more details. You're gonna notice me like fidgeting over here and it's because I'm always, ow, I clipped her nails and they're still sharp. I'm always fighting with Sophie. She always wants to participate. Uh, let's get into some more details here. So the angle measure, a degree is one 360th of a circle because there are 360 degrees in a circle. Another maybe even better way to say that for our purposes is that a degree is 1 360th of a full rotation. Full rotation. Can I make that a little skinnier? Yes, there we go. All right. Uh, so if I spin around 360 degrees, I've I've spun all the way around, right? I didn't actually go anywhere. I'm just standing in place, spinning around. Sophie's on the move, however. Hey, that's not very ladylike. Let's look at some general examples here. So this first example that we're seeing is an acute angle because it's an angle, a positive angle measure that's less than 90 degrees. The second one is a right angle, 90 degrees. The next one is obtuse, between 90 and 180 degrees. And I don't actually know what this next one's called. Straight angle, a flat angle, not much of an angle at all, a really big angle, strange angle. Call it what you want. What is a radian? A radian is another unit of measure that we use to measure amounts of rotation. 
and a degree, we already said, is 1 360th of a full rotation. So if now we're not using degrees and we're using radians, what's a radian? One radian is an amount of rotation, or the size of an angle measure, in this example, theta, it's the size of an angle measure that causes the intercepted arc, which here has a length of s, here's your intercepted arc. So an angle measure, again, in this case theta, an angle measure of one radian causes the intercepted arc to be equal in length to the length of the radius. So here, if theta measured one radian, then s would equal r. And if you look at this little formula here, surely if s and r are the same, then we're dividing something by itself and theta is equal to one. Anything divided by itself is equal to one. One what? One radian. In this example, we're being told that r is equal to five and s is equal to 30. So if we say that theta is equal to s divided by r, here we have 30 feet divided by five feet, and that is equal to six. The 30 over five reduces, the feet cancel, and just as sort of part of the formula, we're going to introduce the units radians. In this example, theta is still being found by taking the arc length and dividing it by the radius, in this case 600 centimeters, and we're going to divide it by one meter. However, we need to have the same units on the top and the bottom. And once we have those same units, as we saw in the previous example, those same units are going to cancel out. So let's take the 600 centimeters divided by the one meter and multiply it by one. Because when you multiply by one, nothing actually changes. The fraction might, might change what the fraction looks like, but multiplication by one doesn't change its value. So let's pick a very specific version of the number one. How about one meter, which is equivalent to 100 centimeters. So here my numerator and denominator are of equal value, therefore I am taking something and dividing it by itself, therefore that fraction is equal to one, multiplying by one doesn't change anything, so we're good to go. Let's cancel some stuff out. The meters cancel here, the centimeters are canceling here, and we need one more color perhaps. The 600 over 100 reduces, leaving us with just a six in the numerator. Therefore, this is equal to six. Six what? Six radians. So these two problems gave us the same answer, and this is gonna happen from time to time. The iPad that I'm working on is being routed through a USB-C to HDMI cable, I'm pretty sure. And then it's going through a video switcher, and then it's coming into my computer as a webcam. And it's routing my Sony as my webcam, my actual webcam, through the same switcher. Every once in a while the iPad's like, yeah, I'm not having it anymore, so it just goes black. I unplug it, I replug it, everything's fine. So I apologize for that instance and all the rest of them. Can't apologize every time. It's not my fault. Right, so in both of these problems, the answer is six radians. Interesting, because we have different lengths of our intercepted arcs, different radius measures, and I did say radius there. But what's happening is whether I'm working with a circle that, that's this big, or if I'm working with a circle that's this big, it doesn't actually matter because the same size interior angle measure is necessary in order to intercept those two different arc lengths. So really all you're doing is scaling the circle up or scaling it down. 
For that matter, check out this circle. Watch this. Did the circle get bigger? Well, sure it did, but all I did was move it closer to the camera. I'm just sort of zooming in on it, okay? But nothing really changed. That's what's happening in these two problems. Let's keep going. All right. Now, the circumference of a circle, so if we were to go all the way around a circle for our intercepted arc length, then S would be equal to the circle's circumference. How do you calculate the circumference of a circle? You take the radius and multiply it by 2 pi. That's what's happening here. So our S value in this very specific example is 2 pi r. We're still dividing by the radius, which is r, and when we simplify this fraction, the r's cancel, leaving us just with 2 pi. 2 pi what? What are the units? Still radians. So, what that tells us is that one revolution, or one full rotation, is equal to 360 degrees, is equal to 2 pi radians. That's important. If you're going to highlight something or put a star next to something, you can do that right there. So we've got this equivalence that's happening here, and what if we need to convert back and forth between degrees and radians? There's a multiplier that will help us to make that conversion. If we're starting with degrees, we will need to multiply by... We'll need degrees in the denominator, radians in the numerator, so the degrees down here are going to cancel with the degrees in that numerator, degrees over 1. And 2 pi radians, we just said, is equal to 360 degrees. So this is the multiplier that you want to use when you're converting from degrees to radians. The multiplier that you'll use to convert from radians to degrees is the reciprocal of that fraction. 360 degrees divided by 2 pi radians. I'm using DEG and RAD instead of writing out degrees and radians. If you're more comfortable writing them out, at least initially in your study of pre-calculus, I think that's a fine idea. Let's do these two examples of making conversions. So I'm going to take these 18 degrees, I'm going to multiply it by 2 pi radians over 360 degrees. And what cancels or reduces? Well, the degree measure symbol here is going to cancel out with these degrees in the denominator. That's good. Now we're going to have radians uh, remaining in the numerator. The 2 next to the Sorry, when I put my hand on the iPad, sometimes it starts moving it around. Uh, the 2 and the 360 are going to reduce. So the 2 turns into a 1, and the 360 turns into a 180. And then the 180 and the 18 are going to reduce with each other, leaving us just with a multiple of 10 in the denominator. So in the numerator, we have a pi, in the denominator, we have a 10, and for units, we have radians. So 18 degrees is equal to pi over 10 radians. And pi is the number that you know fairly well, even if you just think of it as 3.14. That's what we're talking about. So this, is a, this as a decimal is a really nasty number. Pi over 10, 3.14 divided by 10 is... 0.314. And then there are a bunch more numbers that come after that because you know that pi is a non-terminating, non-repeating, irrational number, a decimal that goes on forever and never repeats. So pi over 10 is the way to express your final answer there unless requested otherwise. This is an exact answer, all right? Not a decimal approximation. Let's look at the next one, pi over 17 radians. I'm going to move this over a little bit just so that we stay away from that previous problem. We could even put in a, an extra line there. Let's take the pi over 17, and we'll put radians. And I did sort of put them up in the numerator there a little bit uh, intentionally. 
And we're going to multiply this by our other multiplier, which is 360 degrees over 2 pi radians. You'll notice sometimes I put RAD, sometimes I put RADS. I don't think either one of those is a standard. You should probably be more consistent in your notes than I'm being in my notes. Hopefully you're using pencil. You can just go back and erase the S's. So this is it. All we have to do is start simplifying now. So let's cancel some stuff out. The units of radians are going to cancel from the top and the bottom. This multiple of pi and the numerator here cancels out with the pi and the denominator. The 360 over 2 is going to simplify similar to how it did in the previous example, this time leaving us with a 180 in the numerator. And that's all the simplifying we can do. So looking across the numerators, I see the 180. In the denominator, I see the 17. And for units, I see degrees. You could put the degree, the word degree, or the DEG, you could put it in the numerator next to the 180, or you can put it next to the fraction, or you could put a degree symbol, I suppose, on the 180. Just don't put the DEG in the denominator, all right? When you're doing a homework assignment, my students anyway will be typing this into a text entry box and the units will probably already be provided. You'll just be typing in the 180 over 17. Again, a very nasty decimal, so please, unless specifically requested, do not answer that question using a decimal approximation. Just answer with the fraction. Even if it's an improper fraction, that's okay. Now this is an important conversation. This is the unit circle, and many of you have been instructed, oh, excuse me, have been instructed to memorize the unit circle in the past. But what I'm going to do is march you through a method that I like in order to sort of build or construct or generate the unit circle for yourself. And as I've told my students, uh, some of them already, all you have to do is be able to count to 12, and you can do this. Uh, we're only going to layer in the radian measures at the moment. You could go back through and put in degree measures. You could then go back through and put in coordinates of all of these points on the unit circle. I'm only going to do the radian measures at the moment. Eventually, we'll get to the coordinates, and then we'll take that to the moon. But for now, we know that all of our amounts of rotation start out aiming in the direction of the positive x-axis, so to the right, or east, maybe I'll say sometimes. And that's so that we're going to say that that's pointing in the direction of zero radians. If you rotate all the way around the circle, if I take, well, I don't know how to do that. So if we start out uh, aiming to the right, and I start rotating my uh, terminal side, Clock, uh, counterclockwise around the circle. If I rotate it all the way around, it ends up aiming to the right again. So I have rotated my terminal side of my angle all the way around the circle, which means I rotated it 2 pi radians. Previously, you might have answered 360 degrees. You'd be right, except we're going to have this conversation in radians. So 2 pi radians is correct there. So I'm going to put a little note over here to the right that says also 2 pi. So to the right is aiming in the direction of 0 radians or equivalently 2 pi radians. Now if a full rotation is 2 pi radians, then a half of a rotation, just going from the positive x-axis and rotating over so that we're aiming to the left, essentially, would be half of a rotation, which would be half of 2 pi, which is pi. So when we're aiming to the left, we're pointing in the direction of pi, you could say. If we cut that in half again, so that instead of aiming to the left, and now we're going to be aiming up, half of pi is pi over 2. 
So we will say that when we're pointing in the upward direction, or if we draw a terminal side in the upward direction, we've drawn it in the direction of pi over two. What we're really saying is that with this as a terminal side and this as your initial side, that this amount of rotation is equivalent to pi over two radians. Equivalently, 90 degrees, that's a 90 degree angle. But in radians, we're gonna say that it, that angle measures pi over two. Let's cut that in half again. Let's only rotate until we're pointing in this direction. Pi over two divided by two makes pi over four. So the rotation that goes from pointing to the right to pointing into the middle of the first quadrant requires an amount of rotation that you would previously have called 45 degrees, but now we're gonna call it an amount of rotation pi over four radians. I've put the pi over four out there on the unit circle. What the pi over four, over four really is, where I should really draw it, but I'm not going to ever, well, I shouldn't say ever, I will eventually, but that's really the pi over four. The pi over four is really inside that angle. It is the angle measure, okay? We're just writing it at the end of the terminal side of the angle. It's a little strange, but I'd say that this is uh, pretty important for you to make that connection. Even though I'm putting the pi over four out on the unit circle, what it really is is referring to this angle measure. Okay, here we go. Starting from the positive x-axis, if I rotate up to here, that amount of rotation is pi over four radians. If I rotate that amount again, it puts me pointing straight up, which is another pi over four radians. So how many pi over four radian amounts of rotation have I done? Two of them. Here's the first one, here's the second one. So that is two pi over fours. If I do it again, that would rotate me around into here so that my terminal side is pointing into the middle of the second quadrant. And in order to get there, I had to start at the positive x-axis and rotate three pi over fours. And to end up pointing all the way to the left, I have to rotate some more. Another pi over four, which means I've rotated a total of four pi over fours, which is of course equivalent to pi, which means we're doing this correctly. We can continue that process of drawing these arrows, which you could do in your notes, except it's going to get a little bit full. You're going to end up with maybe too many arrows, unless you're using different colors, but it's nice that I get to use this pen and I can just click the back button in order to do erasing. But what I want you to know is that we're doing all of these bits of rotation, each of which is the same amount, pi over four is the amount of rotation that keeps happening over and over again. That causes us to be pointing in a certain direction, so to speak. And if we tack on that fifth pi over four, we would be aiming in this direction. So we'll call it five pi over four. And if we do the sixth one, that causes us to be aiming, oops, I wrote five pi over four in the wrong spot. There it is. Then if we do the sixth one, we'll be end up we'll end up aiming south. So we'll label that one with a six pi over four. We do it again, we'll end up aiming southeast into the middle of the fourth quadrant. We'll label that one seven pi over four. And if we do the eighth one, we end up aiming to the right again, which is in the direction of zero and two pi, which is equivalent to eight pi over fours worth of rotation. So that took us all the way around the circle. So you counted to eight, nice job. If you want to draw a new version of this circle for you to take notes on, uh, that's a, 
that's a fine idea. You might even be able to fit that next version of the unit circle right down here. You could put it in and put in your marks in each of the quadrants, do it better than I did it there. Or you can keep working in this diagram depending on how much stuff you wrote on this one already. Or if you're one of my students and you have access to just print out another version of this page, just print this page again, okay? And, and have two versions of it. One for counting around the circle in terms of pi over four. And then what we're going to do next. Instead of counting our way around the circle but in increments of pi over four, I'm gonna take this pi over two that we had up here and I'm gonna cut it, instead of cutting it in half, I'm gonna cut it in thirds. A third of a pi over two, in other words, a third of my first quadrant would take the first quadrant and cut it into pieces that look like this. In order to rotate from my positive x axis up to the first one of those available terminal sides, I would need to rotate not a degree measure, but we're gonna use a radian measure, which is a third of pi over two, which is pi over six. So this angle measure in here, I should really be labeling it in here, pi over six, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna put that notation out here, pi over six. And in fact, I'm gonna use a different color so it's easy to see the difference. Let's use red or green, let's use green. Mm, it's not different enough, let's use red. There's pi over six. And then if we rotate another 30 degrees, otherwise known as another pi over six radians. How many pi over sixes have we rotated? Well, here's the first one and there's the second one. We've rotated two pi over sixes. And then if we do it again, we will have rotated three pi over sixes. And does three pi over six reduce? Absolutely, to pi over two, due north, all right. Let's keep counting by or rotating in increments of pi over six. Again, takes us to four pi over six, which reduces, but don't, don't worry about reducing it just yet. Just leave it there as four pi over six, because then we're gonna do it again, which takes us to five pi over six. And then again, which takes us to be aiming due west, we have rotated a total of six pi over sixes which reduces and equals pi. We're on the right track, good, let's keep going. Another one takes us to seven pi over six. Another, we've rotated eight increments of pi over six, which does reduce, but don't do it yet. Do it again. Notice I've got three arrows in the first quadrant, three in the second quadrant, that was my third in the third quadrant, taking us to nine rotations or iterations of pi over six. That's a nine there. Again, 10 pi over six. Again, 11 pi over six. We always end up crossing the 11. 11 pi over six, there we go. And the last time, takes us to 12 pi over six, which of course is equivalent to two pi. We've gone all the way around the circle. I told you all you had to do was be able to count to 12 and you could generate the unit circle, at least this layer of it. So we've got all of our pi over sixes and pi over fours. And let's just take one quick look back in the first quadrant where we wrote two pi over six. Let's reduce that one and we'll call it pi over three. So two pi over sixes is equivalent to one pi over three. So instead of doing this little pi over six bit of rotation and this little bit uh, of a pi over six amount of rotation, instead of doing those two separately, let's just do it as one larger turn right, as though I'm standing in place and then I'm, I'm actually on a swivel chair. I could just rotate pi over three instead of starting out here and rotating a pi over six, stopping, scratching my head, and then rotating another pi over six. 
Just do it all in one fluid motion to rotate pi over three radians. If we do that once, we're aiming high in the first quadrant. If we do another rotation of pi over three, we end up over here, and now we're aiming high in the second quadrant. Another, and, we, and look at that, and that's two pi over three, which is equivalent to four pi over six. If we do it again, one more nice fluid motion, another rotation of pi over three in the positive direction causes us to be aiming in the direction of the negative x-axis. We're aiming to the left. How many pi over threes was that? It was three pi over three, which is equivalent to pi. All right, let's just draw in those last few iterations of that. Here's another nice sweep. So now we're low in the third quadrant. That's equivalent to four pi over threes. Another sweep takes us to be low in the fourth quadrant. That's supposed to be an arrow, there we go. That 10 pi over six is five pi over three. And the last turn takes us back to the positive x axis, which is six little movements of, or rotations of pi over three. 6 pi over 3 equals 2 pi. No surprise anymore. So you've counted your way around the circle in terms of pi over 6s, pi over 4s, and now pi over 3s. Could we also count our way around in terms of pi over 2? We could, and that would be the last one. North is 1 pi over 2. West, hmm, that looks like east, doesn't it? Let's go that way. West is two pi over two, which is equivalent to pi. South is three pi over two, which is equivalent to six pi over four and nine pi over six. There's the three pi over two. And finally, if we end up aiming west, there we go, aiming to the left. No, I wanna be aiming to the right, darn it. I should have just done it with the pen on the diagram. We would be aiming at four pi over twos, which reduces to two pi. All right, so you can count your way around by pi over two also. Those are the ones that you need to know. I say if you've got the time available, regenerate this entire diagram one layer at a time by counting your way around the unit circle in terms of pi over sixes and pi over fours in particular. You could just do those two, the pi over sixes and pi over fours, and then reduce the resulting fractions like four pi over six, uh, eight pi over six, six pi over four. Just reduce those, you'll end up with all of the correct radian measures, all right? That's a good way to get familiar with this because these are some of the key building blocks of all of the topics that we're gonna talk about in this course. If we don't know where these angle measures are, we're gonna be feeling kind of lost. Draw each angle in standard position. So I'm gonna think of this first angle as, let me lift my chair up a little bit, there we go. That's better. I'm gonna think of this first angle as being negative two pi over threes. So the negative tells me I'm gonna be rotating down how, how much down, not how far. It's, it's an amount of rotation. It's not a distance, it's an amount of rotation. We're standing here at the center of this circle and we're not leaving. So there's no distance, we're just turning, okay? The negative says I'm rotating in the downward or clockwise direction. The pi over three tells me how much and the two tells me how many pi over threes. So let's start on the positive x axis Let's rotate down one pi over three, which is two pi over sixes. And then let's rotate another pi over three. And this is therefore negative two pi over three. At least that's how we label it. Really, It's this angle measure that's negative two pi over three. We just put the label 
or the size of the angle measure at the end of the terminal side. Let's try negative 7 pi over 4. Negative 1 pi over 4. 2 pi over 4. Negative 3 pi over 4. Negative 4 pi over 4. Negative 4 pi over 4. Doesn't that reduce to negative pi? It does. It's a half a rotation in the negative direction. Negative 5 pi over 4, negative 6 pi over 4, negative 7 pi over 4. There you go. Negative 7 pi over 4. Halfway up the first quadrant. You could have gotten that a little bit faster by going immediately, immediately to negative 8 pi over 4, which would be aiming to the right, and then back off 1. Instead of going all the way around to negative 8 pi over 4, realize that you overshot the mark by 1 pi over 4 and back up to negative 7 pi over 4. If that made sense to you, great. If it didn't, let it go. Don't worry about it. Just count your way around in the correct direction by applying those 7 steps valued at pi over 4 in the negative direction. All right, uh, oh, you're hidden, there we go. Okay, so coterminal angles. <clears throat> I'm actually gonna reference this previous diagram that we have here. Negative seven pi over four is, it's in the first quadrant. Is that the most efficient way to end up in the first quadrant? Yeah, not so much. Much more efficient would have been to just start at the positive x-axis and rotate up positive 1 pi over 4. So what I'm telling you is that negative 7 pi over 4, that's like an equal sign that has three bars in it. It's equivalent to positive 1 pi over 4. So because those two angle measures, radian measures, point in the same direction, Okay, all of this is kind of uh, casual, sort of loose terminology that I'm using, right? Pointing in the same direction. Because negative pi over 7 pi over 4 and positive 1 pi over 4 point in the same direction, we can say that those two angles are coterminal angles. Now, what if I, instead of uh, using negative 7 pi over 4, what if I then went and rotated, what if I kept going? What if I went all the way around again? I'd end up at negative 15 pi over four, but I still end up at the same place. The terminal side of my angle would still be aiming in the same direction. So that would be another co-terminal angle. I can keep rotating in the negative direction, or instead of in green, Instead of just rotating up to here and stopping at positive pi over 4, I could have kept going all the way around and back to here again. Now that last green curve that I drew starts here and finishes here. It went all the way around the circle. I started at positive pi over 4 and I literally added by drawing a full rotation. What's a full rotation in radians? 2 pi. What's pi over 4 plus 2 pi? Well, that's 9 pi over 4. So another coterminal angle is. 9 pi over 4. You getting the hang of this coterminal angle thing? Conceptually, my guess is, yeah, you got the idea. Creating them for yourself may be a different story. So let's keep going. There's something here that I don't love, and it's this. I'd prefer in your notes if you wrote it as theta plus or minus 
2 pi k because 2 pi is a full rotation and k is how many full rotations we're adding or subtracting in. Just like 360 degrees is a full rotation and the k value over there tells us how many full rotations of 360 degrees we are adding or subtracting to whatever the starting angle theta is. In, this, in the example I was just doing on the previous slide, uh, I was using pi over 4 as my starting angle, so to speak. That would be my theta value. In this diagram that we see right here, it is positive 5 pi over 6 that's being used as the starting angle. And then in this sort of magenta color here, that's too big. Rain it in. In magenta, we're seeing this um, different depiction of a path that can lead you to that same destination. The part of that path that I really like is this part, starting from here and moving my way from the 5 pi over 6 terminal side all the way around again. Notice that in that yellow highlighter that I just used, I, I implemented a full rotation. This part is already the 5 pi over 6. But in yellow, that's the additional full rotation. What's a full rotation in radians? 2 pi. What's 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi? Well, once you get a common denominator, 17 pi over 6. All right, 5 pi over 6 plus 12 pi over 6. That's the full rotation equals 17 pi over 6. So that's a bit about coterminal angles. Let's look at an example. We're trying to find the positive coterminal angle that is less than 360 degrees. What in the world, where in the world, is negative 760 degrees? You could draw a picture, and we could start at the positive x-axis, and we could rotate in the negative direction. One full rotation, well oh, that was not very good. One full rotation would be negative 360 degrees, and then we could do it again and we would come around to negative 720 degrees, and then we would have to go another negative 40 degrees in order to finally arrive at negative 760 degrees. What we want to do is kind of unwind that until we end up with a positive radian measure that lands us in the same place so that we're aiming, so to speak, in this direction. I want to know what that red angle measure is. How do I generate it? The answer to that question is I'm going to take the negative 760 degrees and I'm going to keep adding full rotations. I add 360 degrees to it and I get negative 400 degrees. Not good enough. So I'll take the negative 400 degrees and I'll add another 360 degrees, and that gives me negative 40 degrees. I'm getting closer, right? Here's the negative 40 degrees, but I want a positive coterminal angle. So we're gonna do it one more time. Let's take the negative 40 degrees and add another 360 to it, and that gives us positive 320 degrees. That is what I drew in red over there to the left. So I've put a red box around it. You might not be using all of these colors. You might wanna go out and get all these colors that I'm using. See if you can get them in colored pencils that are actually erasable. That way we can be using the same colors and you'll know your notes will look just like mine and maybe that'll help them to make a little bit more sense. Or maybe it'll make them more confusing because you need to add to the challenge of this stuff, right? Uh, Anyway, the, pot, the correct answer for this problem is positive 320 degrees. It ends us up with a terminal side of our angle pointing in the same direction as if we had rotated 
negative 760 degrees. In order to solve the next problem, which is 23 pi over 5, that's larger than a full rotation. I want a positive coterminal angle that's less than 360 degrees, in other words, less than 2 pi. 23 pi over 5 is too big. So let's take 23 pi over 5, which is greater than 2 pi. So let's take that 23 pi over 5 and subtract a full rotation. In other words, we'll take the 23 pi over 5 and subtract 10 pi over 5. These are equivalent. I created a common uh, that's that just looks like scribble. Lower the opacity, raise the diameter. Let's try that again. 2 pi is equivalent to 10 pi over 5. I just made a common denominator so that I can do the subtraction more easily and I get 13 pi over 5. Is that my final answer? No, it's not my final answer because 13 pi over 5 is still too big. It's bigger than 2 pi. So let's take the 13 pi over 5, subtract another full rotation of 10 pi over 5, and we get 3 pi over 5. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our final answer. A positive coterminal angle less than 2 pi. We're already 47 minutes into this video, which is why I'm not doing those additional example problems. I want to, I want to, I want to finish this first set of notes like ever, please. So let's talk about arc length. This should look familiar. Radian measure is found by taking your arc, intercepted arc length and dividing it by the radius. Theta must be non-negative and measured in radians. This relationship is true if and only if theta is a positive or non-negative angle measure measured in radians. Example number five says, find the length of the arc on a circle of radius r intercepted by a central angle theta. Instead of giving us r and s in this problem, we're being given r and theta, and we're supposed to be finding s. There's a problem though. This angle measure is being given to us in degrees. We need to convert it to radians. So let's do that first. Theta is equal to sixty degrees, which is equal to sixty degrees over one times two pi radians over 360 degrees. Let's cancel some stuff out. The degree measures cancel. The 60 and the 360 reduce, leaving us with 60 in the denominator. Then the 60 and the two are gonna reduce leaving us with a 30 in the denominator. Sorry, when I reduced the 60 and the 360, it should have just been a 6. There we go. And then the 6 and the 2 reduced, leaving us with a 1 over 3. So in the numerator, the only thing we have left is a pi. In the denominator, there's a 3 and the unit measure is radians. So we've got our theta value. Now let's go into the formula. Theta is equal to S over R. Our theta value we now know is pi over three. That's equal to, we don't know what our S value is. That's what we're finding. We were given an R value of 16 inches. That's an IN, 16 IN for inches. And 
Now we need to solve for s. So multiply both sides by 16, and we get 16 pi over three inches is equal to the intercepted arc length. Unless the question says answer with a decimal approximation rounded to the nearest hundredth or something like that, this is what you're going to type in as your final answer. It wouldn't be very valuable to a carpenter who's trying to cut a 2x4 to the right length, but we're not carpenters, are we? So let's just leave it as that weird improper fraction. So we're using the same formula there. We were just solving for a different variable. And here we're talking about linear and angular speed. Now linear speed, you know what speed is, like miles per hour or meters per second. A distance divided by an amount of time, miles per hour, meters per second. Angular speed is different. It's an amount of rotation per unit of time. Like in your car, as you excel, or if you, in your car, if it's running and you're just sitting there at a stoplight, you might look at your tachometer and see that the needle is pointing at just a little bit above one. That's 1200 revolutions per minute, RPMs, all right? amount of rotation per unit of time, revolutions per minute. Now there they're just saying revolutions. They're not saying 1,200 two pies per minute. Although they could, that would be 2,400 pi radians per minute. Sophie, stop baby. You've been so good because you haven't been here. Just, just rest. All right, let's bring it Get it back. Here we go. Okay, so let's look at some definitions. If a point is in motion on a circle of radius r through an angle of theta radians in an amount time t, then its linear speed, linear speed now, is v equals s over t. s is an arc length. It's going to be measured in something like inches. t is measured in time, so you've got inches per second maybe. Now the next one says where s is the arc length given by s equals r theta angular speed. So angular speed now is this little w, which is equal to theta divided by t. Theta is an angle measure. We're going to use radians. Radians divided by time, that's an amount of rotation divided by an amount of time. So that is angular speed. The little w, I'll call it a w, I think it's actually a lowercase omega, but we'll call it w, that's fine. And uh, what's happening here is some conversions, they're showing some equivalent relationships. S is indeed equal to r times theta, so they're replacing the s with an r times theta. And then they're moving the r down to here instead of leaving it in the numerator. And why would they do that? Because theta divided by t is equal to, at the top of your screen, that's the little w. So we're going to take this little w and we're going to replace the theta over t with the little w so that it's going to say r times w. And there it is. v is equal to, oh, put a v is equal to up here if you want. That's a true statement. v is equal to, linear velocity is equal to s over t which it turns out is also equal to the radius times your angular velocity, rw. v equals rw. All right, jot that one down, v equals rw. And then on the next line in your notes, it should say velocity equals radius times angular velocity. And here we go into an example problem. I'm going to write it down even. Linear velocity is equal to radius times angular velocity. All right, express 20 revolutions per second as radians per second. 20 revs per one second. 
Well, I know what a rev is. A rev is a rotation, it's a full rotation. And a full rotation is equal to, in radians, you say it, one ro full rotation in radians is equal to two pi. One full rotation is two pi radians. So this says 20, two pi's, or two pi radians. We're still dividing that by one second per second. And so what we end up with is 20 times two makes 40 times pi is 40 pi. What are the units? Radians per second. That was a nice little unit conversion, wasn't it? Just replacing revs with two pi's. Let's try the next one. Find the positive radian measure of the angle that the second hand of a clock moves through in 35 seconds. I like this. Find the positive. Now, <clears throat> this problem, there's a handful of different ways that you can solve it. The way I'm going to solve this one is using a ratio or is it a proportion? Maybe it's both. Maybe it's one proportion in ratio to it. Doesn't matter. Check this out. Uh, 35 seconds is to 60 seconds, which is a full rotation of the second hand around a clock face, as, that's an equal sign, as, find the positive radian measure, theta, measured in radians is to 2 pi. So I have a partial rotation compared to a full rotation equals a partial rotation compared to a full rotation. So this is one way to solve this problem. In order to solve for theta, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 pi. Actually, I think I might simplify the left-hand side of my equation first. So 35 and 60 are both divisible by 5, and the, the units are going to cancel, so we can let go of the seconds. And 35 divided by 5 is 7, 60 divided by 5 is 12, and that's equal to theta over 2 pi radians. Multiply both sides by 2 pi, and you get 7 times 2 pi over 12 is equal to theta. We can simplify the 2 over 12, so that reduces to a 1 over 6, and we have 7 pi over 6 equaling theta. 7 pi over 6 is an angle measure that you have already heard in this lecture. 0 is aiming to the right. 1 pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, 6 pi over 6 is aiming due west to the left. So 7 pi over 6 is one more tick down into the third quadrant. So you're high in the third quadrant, just a little bit below the negative x-axis. Uh, all right, so that's, that's one method. I would go through all the methods, but then we would be here forever, and we're pushing the one-hour mark. And I'm going to hold off on that word problem. Um, I'm going to let you do some thinking as you do your homework and run into your own word problems. Plus, that way I can end this video before I hit 60 minutes. Hey, I know that this was a really long first introduction into this course or this topic. Um, I appreciate you hanging with me on it. I hope you took some good notes. I hope it gave you some good insight. I'm telling you, it's worth it to stick with it, especially when we're dealing with these really fundamental building blocks. It's going to make this stuff that comes later considerably more attainable. All right? Stay with it, and um, I'll see you again real soon, probably in the very next video. Uh, subscribe if you'd like. Appreciate it. Otherwise, there should be, in the very near future, a... Uh, link showing up so that you can just click right into the next video. Thanks again.